that Donna French's mother, Nina Adams, died this week, and also Allison Jarvie's mother, Linda Connell, died this week as well. So we want to remember Donna and Allison and those families in our prayers through this time. Friends, let us stand and find somebody you don't know very well and be sure you greet one another in the name of Christ. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes. Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. We know you love us, Lord Jesus, and we come to show our love for you. Bless us in this time so that when we leave this place, we may be more committed to you and to the one who sent you into our world. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. And let all the people say, Amen. Good.
notice that when we get to our hymn, the first hymn, we have some special instructions for singing, dividing between the upper and lower voices on stanzas two and three. Our call to worship today is an entire chapter of the Bible. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the Bible. This is the entire psalm. I invite you to stand and join with me in our call to worship. Praise the Lord, all nations. For the Lord's steadfast love toward us is great. Praise the Lord. Trusting in God's gracious love and mercy, let us come together and confess our sins. Creator God, you have set us in your beautiful world and have put us in charge of a portion of your creation. We confess that we are not always responsible for what you place in our care. We confuse stewardship with ownership and imagine that what you give us is ours to possess, to use, or abuse as we wish. Have mercy upon us. Make us grateful, not just for your creation, but for your redeeming love in Jesus Christ. Then help us to use all that we have and all that we are for your glory on earth, for Jesus' sake.
Friends, there is good news. In Christ, we have new life. Our old lives are gone and new lives have begun. And in Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. with me. O Lord our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The first reading is from Philippians. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Uadia and I urge Sintek to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me, in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord. Always, again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord.
I would like to invite the children to come join me here at the front of the church. Hello, everybody. Good to see you all, guys. Everybody? Wonderful. Good to see all y'all. How you doing? Everybody well? Good. Uh, I want to tell you a story about Jesus. One time, Jesus was in church, and it was time for the offering where people bring their money up to the front, you know? And the way they did it, they would actually come forward and bring their money. So some people came. Leah, move over this way just a little, because i got to get up. They came up with big bags of money and put it down like that. And everybody said, ooh, that's a lot of money. Because, you know, actually, that's real money in there, too. Yeah, pretty good, huh? And so all the people were watching, and they thought that was really cool that they gave all this heavy money. And then a poor widow came up, and all she had was two pennies. You see them? And she put her two pennies up there. And hardly anybody paid any attention to her. Now, I have want to ask you guys, which is more, this bag of money or these two pennies? The bag has a lot more money. You know what Jesus said? He said, she has given more. Because all these other people, he said, were real rich, and they could give that money. It wasn't very hard for them to do that. But she gave, since she was poor, just about everything, all she had. Micah, that's exactly right. And so, you know, in a couple of weeks, in a few weeks, we're going to be talking about our pledge day. It's kind of like making a promise to God about the money that you will give. And some of the big people will give a lot of money. Some of them will give $10, and some will give 50 and some may even give $100. <laughs> but, but we'll let you all think about that. And you'll say, oh, I can't give that much. I can only give like a nickel or a dime or a quarter, and my money isn't very important. You know what? Your money is important because Jesus looks at what you give, and even if it's two pennies, Jesus says, that's important. So you remember it. And I hope what you will do is make a pledge, a promise to God, to give some of your own money because Jesus looks at your heart, and he knows that's what's important. Okay, let's have our prayer. Put your hands together and repeat after me. Thank you, God, for your gifts to us. Help us to give ourselves to you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can scoot. I am going to be preaching on a different text, and the sermon title is different from what was previously put into the newsletter. Uh, John Roper, earlier this week, asked that I preach on stewardship, which means that I'm talking about money. Don't say you weren't warned. So here we go. And we're using the story of Zacchaeus in the 19th chapter of Luke. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to him, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down. I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was joyful to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and say, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And all God's people said, Some years ago, when I was serving a church in Tennessee, I got into a conversation with a young couple that had just begun uh, attending another Presbyterian church. And I asked them, how's it going? And they said, oh, it's wonderful. We love this church. It's a great place to be. There are lots of activities for us and for our children. But then they said, you know, there is one problem. We're in stewardship season, and they're looking for money and it makes us feel guilty. We, we know the minister doesn't intend it this way, but the message we hear is we got to give, give, and if we don't give, then we feel guilty about it. Well, I happened to know the minister of that church, and I knew that he would not be wanting to speak the message that way, but nevertheless, that's what the couple heard. You got to give, 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 or you're bad, bad, bad. So what are we going to say to that young couple and to others and to us as we come once again in this fall of the year to our time of stewardship? How shall we respond? Well, let's get down to it. I'm going to tell you right now how much you owe. You ready? In fact, somebody asked me one time, uh, preacher, what are the dues to be a member of this church? I'm going to tell you what the dues are right now. You ready for it? Here's how much you got to give. You got it? You owe nothing. The price has been paid. Jesus Christ has given himself for us and there is no obligation. You don't do it out of a sense of burden or guilt. It is all about what Jesus Christ has done for us. You don't need to owe anything. You don't perform anything. You don't do anything. It is free grace. Now, I know an answer like that may be a terrible bit of news for the stewardship committee. Because after all, if you don't talk about a little bit of guilt and, and talk about the bottom line of the church budget, then why give? Here's why you give. It's about grace. It's about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Our response is never one of obligation. It is rather about feeling and responding to what is in our heart with joy. The wallet bone is connected to the heart bone. It's about joy. And that brings us to the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And if you know that song, you went to Bible school a long time ago like I did. But Zacchaeus was not just a wee little man, he was also a hated tax collector. You recall that the Roman Empire and Roman soldiers occupied that whole part of Palestine for many generations. It was just a fact of life. And, and the Roman Empire taxed the people mercilessly. And worse than that, they recruited native people to be the tax collectors. So Zacchaeus was a Palestinian who was regarded really as a traitor. What he would do is charge more than what he was supposed to and therefore rake off some off the top to, as a way to pay himself. Zacchaeus was not a popular person. But Jesus spotted him up in that tree, called him down, and it says that Zacchaeus received him joyfully. And then, in response to his joy, Zacchaeus was generous. The half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone, anything, and he had defrauded some people, I will give back fourfold. You see how it works? The joy that Zacchaeus knew was translated into gratitude and to generosity. Joy was something that was in short supply in the Roman Empire. One modern-day historian said that there was a deep 
pessimism in that society in those days. And why not? The view was that the Roman gods were sort of aloof. They didn't have a whole lot to do with humankind. They didn't much care about human beings, and so it was up to us human beings to kind of get along the best we could. You sort of lived and did what you could and made the best out of life, and then you died. No wonder it was a pessimistic culture. I have to confess there are times when our own sense of joy and, and gladness is challenged by the world in which we live. These have been a difficult few weeks with hurricanes lined up processing across the Atlantic doing death and destruction in various parts of our country. With a crazy man shooting people from the top floor of a hotel in Las Vegas. With now fires out in California taking their own share of death and doing huge destruction. And that doesn't count the little crises that don't make headlines but are real in your life. Uh, the, the word from the doctor that it doesn't look very good, the crisis you have in your family, the problems at work, all the little things that challenge our lives. Um, with the Romans, we may at times feel sort of pessimistic as well, but not with Jesus. Jesus comes to us and calls us to know the joy of responding to the grace of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. We have been set free. We have been given life. Of course it is reason for joy. God has said yes to our world. And so we can say with the 14th century Christian mystic Julian of Norwich, all will be well and all will be well and all manner of things shall be well. We are called, friends, to evidence joy in our lives. And by joy, we don't mean just uh, having fun, like going out to Kentucky Kingdom and riding the roller coaster or cheering for your team on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, those are fun, no doubt about it. But joy is so much more profound. Joy is that deep confidence, even on the bad days, that God is with us that all will be well and all manner of things shall be well. Let's admit we don't always do the best job of showing it. The 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said, uh, Christians ought to look more redeemed. Because sometimes we can be kind of sour, let's admit it. But we are called to a joy. And that joy impels us then to a gratitude and a generosity. Theologian Karl Barth says that my joy causes me to look for occasions to be grateful. Where can I be grateful? Where can I help other people in the name of Christ? I've been saved and redeemed by Christ. Now how can I respond to it? That's where we are all, always trying to look. Joy changes everything. Here's a young man, let us imagine. And he's walking down a street, and you can tell just by looking at him that he is anxious and preoccupied about something. His head is down. He's focused only on himself. Obviously, he's bothered by something. Let us imagine he walks past a, a homeless person who is sitting on the sidewalk, but he doesn't even notice that person. Passes right by. The reason why this young man is anxious is that in his pocket, he's got an engagement ring and he intends to go to his girlfriend and ask her to marry him. And so he goes, and he gathers up his courage, and he pops the question, and she says yes. And they embrace, it's a joyous time. And the young man leaves, and now you can tell his whole attitude is different. There's a spring in his step, and his head is up. And he sees the homeless person and he pulls out a $20 bill and gives it to him and says, have a good day. See, that's what joy does. It, it moves us to a generosity of spirit. I was talking to a woman some time ago, and she reported that her son, the doctors had found a place on her son's skin, on his face. It was going to be necessary for him to take it out off, and they didn't quite know what the nature of it was. And so she was worried and she prayed to God that all things would turn out okay. 
The lesion was removed and it turned out to be benign, no problem. And she gave great thanks to God. Just a few days later, this woman, who was very active in her church, was asked to serve on a presbytery committee. And she first said, probably what I would have said, uh, find somebody else. But then she remembered how grateful she had been to God and how she was filled with joy at what God had done for her. And she called him back and said, put my name down, I'll serve. You see, joy leads us to a gratitude and to a generosity. To know joy is to be led to being generous. And then we can wonder, can you reverse the equation? Can generosity lead to joy? Can I be in a grumpy mood and do something generous and it causes me to feel joyous? Can my wallet jumpstart my heart? There's a remarkable statement in, of all places, the Presbyterian Book of Order, that rather sober document. But I've put it in the bulletin today. If you've got your bulletin, you can find it's right there where the sermon title is. And underneath are these remarkable words. Those who follow the discipline of Christian stewardship will find themselves called to lives of simplicity, generosity, honesty, hospitality, compassion, receptivity, and concern for the earth and God's creatures. Wow. You want to be more honest, more generous, lead a life that is more simple? Do you want to have compassion? Do you want to be receptive to other people? Do you want to care for God's earth and God's creatures? Then practice the discipline of stewardship. You give, you are generous, and it transforms your very life. You see, the way I use my money really is a reflection of my faith. My checkbook and yours are theological documents. You look at what you spend your money on and it shows what the priorities are in your life. You're, you're in encouraged to, to look to see how do I use what I have to reflect the joy I feel in God through Jesus Christ. We really haven't talked much at all about giving to the church. Why give to the church? You know, if I'm going to be generous, I can give my money to a lot of things. I can give to United Way. I can give to Salvation Army. Those are good organizations. I hope you support them. Uh, but let me tell you my own personal answer, why I give to the church. I give to the church because I love Jesus. And with all its faults, the church is still the place in our society where we talk about Jesus and where we pray to God through Jesus Christ. It's the place where we study about Jesus and understand what Jesus would have us do. I give to the church because this is the place where children sing, as we did this morning, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And they study what those words mean. I give to the church because this is where young people go off on mission trips in the name of Christ. I give to the church because this is where habitat houses are built, because all God's children should have a good place to live. I give to the church because we extend hospitality to refugees, welcoming strangers in the name of the one who said, I was a stranger and you took me in. I give to the church because here we all are, struggling with our own faith, and yet we stand and say, or today we will sing it, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I give to the church because I need you to sustain me in my faith. And let's go ahead and push out there. How much should you give? Um, the, the biblical standard is the tithe. You give a tenth, one-tenth of your income. That's a high standard for most of us, and it's hard for many of us to do it. We've got lots of demands on ourselves. And let's be very clear. Remember, we're not talking about guilt here or obligation. God doesn't ask for what we don't have. 
But let's suppose as a personal response to the grace of God, you decide that you want to push out and increase your giving. Let's say you're giving 7%, and you want to push out and try to reach that goal, the tithe, the tenth. That's a commendable thing to try to do, but that's not the hardest increase to make. Or maybe you're already tithing and you know what a blessing it is, so you decide that you want to give more than that, 12%, 14 That's commendable. But that's not the hardest increase to make in your giving. No, the hardest increase to make is to go from 0 to 1%, or even 0 to a half a percent, which is to say you go from just tossing the occasional dollar in the plate when you feel like it to becoming regular and disciplined in your giving, even if it is a small amount. You do it in response to the God who is disciplined in giving to us. God doesn't say, well, I gave him a good sunset yesterday. I think I'll take a day off. No. God's blessings are new every morning and renewed every evening. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. It's a response of joy. It's not about guilt. It's not about feeling some burden, some obligation. God doesn't ask for what we don't have. It's really not finally just about the church and what the church needs. It's about you and about examining your income, your possessions, and looking at how that relates to your faith. Zacchaeus discovered that his joy that he was given in Jesus Christ changed everything. It changed his life. And it can change your life as well. that wonderful message stewardship bill just gave we will be singing our affirmation of faith today so i ask that you please grab your hymnals and turn to hymn number 481 and when you do so please stand and let us sing hymn number 481 to affirm our faith Please be seated. In prayer, we are reminded who we serve. So let us pray. We return to you, O God, reminded of our allegiance to you. We pray for this brilliant earth. Help us to use its resources wisely. 
We lift up in prayer those who inhabit those places on earth where there have been recent natural disasters. Places like Puerto Rico, Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. We pray for those, home, those whose homes, businesses, and lives have been devastated by wildfires in California. Be with the firefighters who work tirelessly to contain them. We pray for your children, our brothers and sisters in Christ, O oh Lord. For those who fight for the rights of others and defend the value of every life. For those who show what it means to be loved by loving others and who serve you by serving others, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, healing the sick, caring for the dying, hearing the voice of the suffering, and reaching those who can seem unreachable. We pray for high school seniors who are working hard to get into college for people who work three jobs and struggle to feed their children, for the mother, father, sister, or brother who was recently diagnosed with cancer, for the friend or loved one who is fighting addiction, for those who feel pressured to do something they are not comfortable with, for our military and their families waiting for them to come home. We mourn for those who have been killed at the hands of terrorists and most recently at the hands of someone who had darkness in their life. We pray that somehow your love can reach into hearts that carry this hatred and violence. We pray for peace and understanding so that fear and anger and pain can be replaced with acceptance, love, and healing. Bless us, O Lord, with this day and meet all its needs. Inspire us to reach out to those whose needs are not being met. Help us serve without judgment and care more for people, especially those who make it difficult for us to care for them. We pray for our staff, our elders, our deacons, and all of us who serve and support God's ministry at our church and in the world. We ask all of these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we do have many blessings. With joy and thanksgiving, let us give back a portion of those through our tithes and offerings. We do have a special offering today, and even though we've already had our hunger walk, that offering will benefit the hunger walk. So please give generously.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Creator God, you are our provider. Bless these gifts and empower us, your church, that through the work of your spirit we may be a refuge for the needy and in their distress a shelter from the storm and shade from the heat. As the light is taken from this place, let your light go out into the world that others may see what you do and give glory to God in heaven. And as you go from this place, be confident of this, that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you and those you love this day and forevermore. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.